is 20 to 28. Normally, a preacher would say, Do you have your Bibles with you? But now, uh, not only your Bibles with you, do you have your apps with you? <laughs> you can use your apps. Uh, one thing good about apps is you have all kinds of versions, right? Translations. So you can and voice. Gather, and sometimes the, the voice, I mean. A lot of explanations, cross references. You got like a complete package that you normally would, you know, back in the time when I was studying in the seminary, you're going to have to go to the library to right. look for all kinds of references like that. But now you have it in your pocket, but take advantage of it. So uh, use your whatever tools you have and study, just learn and grow and, and mature in that way. You know, that's, it's, a, it's always a blessing to have all kinds of uh, uh, available uh, tools that, that you can use for, for God's glory. All right, so Matthew, uh, that screen's still not working, right? So chapter 20 of Matthew, let's read the 20 to 28. Okay, let's all stand, please, and uh, let's honor God's word as we did this in unison. Ready? Begin. Then came to him the mother of the seven and their sons, worshiping him, and desired a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What was that? She said unto him, Grant that thee is my two sons, he said, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he says unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand, and on my back is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life and her answer for men. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Your word is truth. Your word is established in heaven and abides forever. It is without error. Your word is authentic. It is righteous, it is powerful than any two-edged sword that can pierce through our bone and marrow. So Lord, I pray that as you speak today, that you will teach us, that we will humble ourselves and, and declaring before you, dear God, that you are the power, we are the clay. So help us to be moldable, teachable, guide us now, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You see Here's a uh, story in the gospel that many of you know already, and this is one text where you can find so many lessons, and I'd like to present to you the lessons that we can draw from here. But let me begin by, by saying to you that there is no perfect church. Okay? There is no perfect church. Okay? Every church has flaws and deficiencies and strong points and weak points, right? Uh, there is no two churches that have the same exact DNA, uh, okay? so to speak. You understand what I mean by that? There's different compositions of people, and in our case, you know, a lot of Asians uh, and and other other cultures. And uh, I was asked one time by our neighbor, he said, uh, "Is your services in English?" I said, "Yes." And then I figured, oh, because we carry the name first Filipino, so we had the assumption that maybe it's like if you go to a Korean church, most most likely it's in Korean. If you go to a Spanish church. Most likely, like what we have in our afternoon church, in Spanish, it's in Spanish language, or in other cultures, like uh, like uh, like other Asian like Chinese churches. You know, they have it in Chinese, and, uh, but we have it in English. All right, English is not my first language, uh, but when we think of difference uh, differences in churches, not just ethnicity or culture. Uh, 
practices and like I said, you know, some churches are strong in one area but weak in other areas. And it is the same wherever you go. And what causes differences uh, is something that can be, you know, part of the uh, growth of the church maybe, or part of the doctrine of the church, or the practice of the church, and preferences, right? Preferences. Uh, and I think I explained it before that we need to understand the difference between what is biblical and non-biblical and unbiblical, right? Unbiblical. What is biblical? Biblical is what we find in the Bible. What is non-biblical? Those things that we don't find in the Bible. What's unbiblical? Those that contradict what we find in the Bible. So understand that, right? Very simple, very plain. Biblical is what you find in the Bible. The teachings, the doctrines, instructions, commands, promises in the Bible. It's biblical. But there are gray areas in life. Things that were not mentioned in the Bible yet, you know, they can either be right or wrong. So uh, those are non-biblical issues. But what we know plain as like plainly like that's wrong. Why? Because that's unbiblical. So what do you mean by that? Because it contradicts the Bible. It goes against the Bible. So there's different opinions, different uh, differences of beliefs, like I said. But when you look at this story, you find that you know this is a common thing. Whether you have an organization, or a company, or any group of people, or a community, or a church, there will always be some problems along the way, right? The world, the whole, the whole you know, all of mankind, you know, is filled with all kinds of imperfections. You do things a lot of times and we're wrong. And I, I remember a story of a pastor and a music director in an old, you know, first church. They didn't get along. And when a pastor preaches a message, a particular topic, the music director will make the congregation sing a song that sounds like contradictory to the message. <laughs> For example, one week, the pastor preached a message on commitment and challenged the people to be more dedicated, you know, to serve the Lord. And the music director had a song uh, after, this, after the message, and it was, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. So it was a song that contradicted <laughs> the message. So... <laughs> You know, and then the pastor the next day preached a message on giving. Challenged the people to share and to be generous, to be hospitable, and to share in the work of the Lord and to you know contribute to the need, the project. And then the song after that was Jesus paid it all. So, <laughs> so again it sounded contradictory. And then the man again the pastor preached on the problem of the tongue, gossiping and backbiting. And then when the music director asked the people to stand you know, he, he asked the people to sing, I love to tell the story. So again, it's, it sounded contradictory. And again, at that point, the pastor got so tired, it's been happening every Sunday. So what he did was he filed his resignation letter. He came to a point where he actually uh, resigned. But that evening, that gospel hour night, you know, they had uh, the part sang, why not tonight? <laughs> why not tonight? So the following Sunday, the pastor stood there and was like so sorry that, you know, the Lord led him there. And now it seemed like the Lord is pulling him out of that church. And the pastor said, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's just a story, friends. I don't know if it actually happened. But uh, thank God we don't have a music director like that. Praise God. <laughs> Uh, after Ariel sang and I asked him the you know the title of that song. You know when when songs are sang, you you listen to it in your touch. If you have a good heart, you come in today with a good you know not just mood but a good heart, <coughs> good attitude. Then you come prepared. You come to worship. And aren't you thankful that you're not entering into the congregation where there's hostilities and animosity, and so that you're not looking at you know like your peripheral view and was sitting there, was sitting here. After the service, you can't shake hands with everyone. Thank God. It's not like that. Amen? Amen. Amen. What a joy to have a church that is so united and uh, loving and caring for each other. You know, people come and go. But uh, when, when God gives us a blessing of people that will come, we, as much as possible, would like to be friendly and loving and, and caring. It's not easy, right, to do that. Because like I said, we have 
we have differences. But if you've been in the church for a long time, you understand that, you know, church can have bumps here and there, ups and downs. Now we're in a, 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 we're in a stage in our church life where, praise God, we can all smile at everybody, shake hands with everybody, just hug and love one another, and praise God, you know. And may you uh, help contribute to maintaining the unity of the church by praying for the church only if you can every day. That the Lord will preserve us. Now, now, I wish that we could stay like this. But there is no guarantee. You know why? Because when you go to the old, the, the, uh, the old stories of New Testament churches, there was not a single church that you say is perfect. Can you think of any church? How about the church of Corinth? That's the worst, right? What was the problem in Galatia? What's the problem in Galatia? Judaism. What did Paul deal with in Romans? A lot of things. Like even carnality. Like the, the flesh, right? He talked about the flesh a lot of times. And here's what he said in Romans chapter 7. He said, the good things that I desire to do, those are the things that I find hard to do. I actually end up doing the bad things that I don't want to do. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, who shall deliver me from this body of death. I, I can't seem to do the right thing. So if that was the case with Paul, what do you think was the case with carnal believers? What was the problem in, in, in the church in Philippi? It seemed like a, a perfect church, right? It seemed like a flawless church. What was the problem actually when you go to chapter 4? You find that what? What's the case? There were two, two women 